Thank you. Welcome to the Center for U.S. War Veterans Oral Histories at the National Guard Militia Museum of New Jersey in Seagirt, a partner of the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project. Today is December 2nd, 2015. I am Carol Fowler, Director of the Center. My honored veteran is Colonel Robert Beavis, United States Marine Corps retire, who served in the Vietnam War with the United States Marine Corps. He served from November of 1961, total until June of 1992, and was a pilot who flew 150 combat missions, and 100 of which were into North Vietnam. Thank you for wanting to be here today, Colonel Beavis. Can I call you Bob? You certainly may. Thank you. Your eyewitness account is considered a primary historical source and a valuable contribution to the project here. And good morning and welcome. Thank you. Okay. Take me back to life prior to service. Had anyone in your family served before you? Um, yes. My dad was drafted before I was born, a couple months before. And I was born in January 43. And my brother, who is 17 years older than I am, uh, sort of fibbed about his age and also went into the Army Air Corps. So when they both came back in 46, uh, I was three, going on four years old. And they were certainly a good impression to me. My, all my uncles had served also. Oh, okay. Did they ever speak to you about what it was like? Not really. Uh, I don't think too many people really talk about what they did. Right, that's very true. Um, so when you were that young, though, um, what was it like to have two men in the house who you never met before? You know, I can't remember that. I was going to say, so, you seem like you, know, you do it remember. It seemed like good, normal. I, I, yeah. It was, it was good. Good, okay. good life. And how did you come to be in the service? Well, that's uh, kind of an interesting question. Uh, I always wanted to fly uh, since I was a little boy, maybe because my brother was involved in B-17s. And uh, um, just real quick, I'll, I'll bring up my background. Both my folks uh, worked on farms. They grew up living on farms. Uh, when I became, uh, I went to Seton Hall Prep after our Lady of the Valley Elementary School. And at Seton Hall, one day I brought home some forms. Uh, uh, they were for the parents to sign and read. And uh, in it was a, uh, an advertisement basically from the state of Vermont looking for help for the farmers up there. The state of Vermont would pay a teenager $55 a month room and board. And I showed that to my parents. The next thing I knew, I was on a, on a bus going up to Vermont for the summers of my sophomore and junior year in high school. So working hard around dairy cows, uh, milking and uh, shoveling manure and, and planting crops and harvesting and, uh, was quite hard work. I had uh, previously experienced traveling with migrant Mexican laborers up in Wisconsin picking cucumbers at 13 cents a bushel basket. And I thought, wow, that was really hard work. I better get some education. So when it came time to go to college, uh, a lot of my friends at a St. Paul uh, were going to college, and it kind of made sense to go to college rather than going right into the service, which is what I was looking at. At Villanova, I took a real good look at all the armed forces, and I felt that the Marine Corps offered the best opportunity for responsibility uh, as being a pilot to gather responsibility quicker than the other services. So I signed up in my beginning of my sophomore year when I knew I was on track uh, with a major in college to graduate on time, which is the requirements that the Marine Corps platoon leaders class uh, requirement was. So how did I become a, into the military? I wanted to be a pilot, and the military offered the best chance for me. Okay. So you were ROTC, right? No, we called it PLC, platoon leader class. You took no courses whatsoever during the scholastic year, but you spent six weeks for two different summers down in Quantico, Virginia, going through basically officer's candidate school. And you said earlier when you graduated that you were a Lance Corporal, but then you were Well, retired. while you're in uh, the officer program, before graduation, you're an enlisted Marine. And uh, in order to be an enlisted Marine, you have to be given a rank. So uh, you start off as a private, and they paid you while you were in training. And they may have supplemented something while we were in college. I can't remember now whether they did. But after the first summer, uh, I was a Lance Corporal, and after the second summer, a Corporal. 
Uh, so in, that would have been in the summer of 63. In June of 64, I was commissioned a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps. So they had to discharge me first from the enlisted Marine Corps, which they did and gave me an honorable discharge. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> and then? And then, commissioned in uh, June of 64, uh, officers in the Marine Corps and all services have to pay for their own uniforms. And the Marine Corps, if you go back a long while, they had multiple uniforms. In 1964, my uniform expense was over $2,000. So I wrote a letter to the Commandant of the Marine Corps at graduation asking not to come into active duty right away, but give me some opportunity to earn some money, get rid of my debt from college. And uh, I ended up working at the Monmouth Hotel in Spring Lake uh, as assistant reservation manager, earning enough money to pay my uniforms, and then I reported directly to flight school in Pensacola, Florida in September of 64. And flight school uh, is run by the Navy. Of course, we have Marine instructors, uh, and uh, it encompassed almost two years of flying. <coughs> and that I'll elaborate a little bit. Uh, flight school, you start off uh, with pre-flight, where you learn uh, aerodynamics, engineering, uh, physics, uh, military subjects, and, and all the uh, meteorology, all subjects pertain to aviation. After pre-flight, you go to Softly Field, and we flew a small airplane, T-34 Mentor, it was called, uh, which is a single-engine propeller airplane. Once you solo and do aerobatics, uh, you graduate from there. And I went to the jet pipeline, pipeline at Meridian, Mississippi, flying T2s. Then back to Pensacola with the T2 Buckeye to do aircraft carrier uh, certification and landings. We ended up doing uh, seven uh, landings on an aircraft carrier, the USS Lexington, and uh, four were were arrested landings and four catapults. That qualified you for the carrier aviation. After that, I uh, went to Texas, Beeville, Texas, and flew F-9 Cougars. B-E-E-V, like Victor, I-L-L-E, Texas. I never heard it's that. no longer a naval air station. It is now a federal penitentiary, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, the BRAC closures. So in Beeville, we flew the uh, F-9 Cougar, and it's called an F-9 F-8, a uh, single-seat uh, fighter airplane. And we used that airplane to uh, skill ourselves with uh, uh, air-to-ground uh, support, uh, dropping bombs and shooting 20 millimeter. After uh, proficiency, then you went to a F-11 Tiger, Grumman Tiger, for supersonic uh, gunnery and introduction to supersonic flight. Got my wings in uh, April, April 12th, 1966. And I remember well because I don't think I ever worked uh, hard before in my life as I did to be a pilot. Uh, the training was quite rigorous, uh, challenging, and yet rewarding. And uh, so that was in April 66, and then I went to the active Marine Forces, and I reported to uh, Beaufort Marine Corps Air Station, South Carolina, to uh, Marine Air Group uh, 32, and eventually put in, uh, requested to fly F-8 Crusaders, and was put in a squadron uh, VMF 333. And uh, that was uh, from April or May of 66 until November. And during that time, I became proficient in the F-8 Crusader for air combat, uh, air to ground, uh, fighter intercept, night, night fighter. And uh, during that period of time, we would deploy to uh, Boca Chica, B-O-C-A-C-H-I-C, Boca Chica, A, uh, Naval Air Station, which is Key West, Florida. And we stood the hot pad for the Cuba uh, problems that we had back then. We did that for three weeks at a time about every other month. Uh, November, I got orders to Vietnam and uh, left for Vietnam. Joined a squadron VMF 
235 flying F-8 Crusaders and uh, was in the squadron up until July 1st or 2nd of 1967 when a battalion of Marines, 1st Battalion, 9th Marines, uh, got decimated uh, with uh, two of their companies north of the DMZ. The Marine Corps, I'm just going to continue, it'll go pretty fast. The Marine Corps keeps three aviators with every ground battalion, not too many people know that. And uh, one aviator is usually a captain and the other two are lieutenants. And the reason we have aviators is to provide close air support and keep track of the battalion when they're on a move as to where they are to make sure that we don't call in any friendly weapons on ourselves mm -hmm. and that we can transfer uh, uh, the knowledge that we have to the ground marines. Well, in July of 66, a good friend of mine, Warren Kniep, uh, who was a captain, uh, he was serving with 1st Battalion, 9th Marines. And uh, they got ambushed bad, and uh, Warren got captured and uh, tortured, and eventually uh, we were able to get his body back. Oh, I'm so sorry. But uh, when he got killed, I was coming back from North Vietnam on a mission, and I had a wingman, and we still had uh, some bullets, 20 millimeter, about 400 rounds each airplane, and some Zuni rockets, seven inch rockets. And we heard this emergency call, which went out by an Air Force controller called Milky, asking if there was any weapons in the area. And we signed up and uh, told them we were available and got vectored to where 1st Battalion, 9th Marines was in, uh, under terrible fire. Uh, I found out through the airborne forward air controller flying a bird dog airplane, an OV-1, uh, that it was Warren Kniep who was still alive and he was down to 12 men uh, from a company that was over 200 strength. The 12 men were still alive and they were totally surrounded. Warren uh, Kniep asked the OV-10 on a FM radio, which we did not have FM radios in our cockpit, we had UHF radios, asked the uh, airborne FAC uh, for us to the fighters to drop all our weapons directly on them because they wanted to be killed rather than captured. Mm -hmm. And I uh, passed back to them to tell Warren to go ahead and pop a smoke and uh, I'll come down and you can either tell them or not tell them but I'm not going to bomb right on them. I'll put it right up to five yards away from them, all the bullets, and hopefully we'll help them. And I held my wingman high. I went and uh, executed several runs, maybe a dozen, uh, expending the ordnance where I thought best. And then as I got to what we call bingo fuel, where I barely had enough fuel to get back to Da Nang, called my wingman down. I went back to Da Nang, landed at Da Nang Air Base. We had the capability to hot refuel with the engine, <coughs> engine running. It was a single engine airplane, the F-8 Crusader and then go over to the uh, ordnance area and be rearmed to go back and help. And it was kind of pilot discretion as to whether you would do that rather than come into the line and shut down. So I had just refueled and I was on the way to ordnance and uh, got a call on our tactical frequency uh, to come in and shut the airplane down. And I declined and I told him no, I wasn't going to do it, I was going to help learn. And uh, the commanding officer got on the radio and told me to come in and shut down. So I went taxi back into our revetment and uh, shut the airplane down to meet our commanding officer, who unfortunately told me with bad news that Warren has been uh, killed, Warren Kniep. And uh, at that point, he said, I've got more bad news. There'll be a helicopter here in 45 minutes uh, to take you up to uh, north of the DMZ uh, to go ahead and be the air officer for 1st Battalion, 9th Marines. So as an aviator... Hold on, why was that bad news? Well, uh, because 1st Battalion, 9th Marines was called the Walking Dead. Uh, we knew how bad they had been involved and the chances of coming out were not good alive. Like a superstition uh, kind of thing? Not a superstition. Uh, Warren was the air officer, he was killed. Oh. The air officer before him was killed. The air officer before him made it out okay, and is a friend of mine today. Uh, I was wounded uh, so critically uh, with my tour with 1-9, and the officer that, uh, that relieved me, Walt Jones, uh, 
uh, who I didn't know he was going to relieve me because I was medevaced out. But uh, Walter's wife uh, lived in New York, and I'm digressing a little bit. Maybe we'll come back to it. But later on, after wounded, I met. I ended up in St. Albans Naval Hospital in Queens, New York, and uh, a lady by the name of Barbara Jones would come and see me several times, uh, maybe a couple times a week, but uh, very often. And her husband, Walt Jones, and I went through flight training together, and we flew in VMF 333. And uh, Walter's wife, Barbara, was expecting a child when he got orders to go to Vietnam, and I uh, asked my commanding officer if I could go instead of Walt so he could be there for the baby to be born. So we had a closeness. Anyway, Barbara came one day very sad and told me that uh, Walter was just killed. So he was the air officer that relieved me in uh, the 1st Battalion, 9th Marines. Mm. That's a whole study in itself. So back up, uh, flying uh, in Vietnam, uh, our squadron uh, with F-8s, we had 18 F-8 Crusaders, and we had approximately 22 pilots. I don't know, don't remember the exact number. Uh, one of our pilots was shot down just as I arrived in Vietnam. His name is Orson Swindell, and he was captured and spent uh, seven years in North Vietnam prisons. So Warren was always a hero to us. We didn't know if he survived or not, but uh, we always kept Warren in, in mind. Uh, my, as a officer in the Marine Corps, you're not just a pilot. You're also required to uh, have responsibilities in the squadron. I was the administrative officer, and under that title, uh, had no less than about 15 responsibilities in the squadron. A squadron in combat, uh, we have approximately 200 uh, men at the time, no women, and uh, there's quite a bit of admin functions going on, whether it's leave or somebody got hurt or injury reports or uh, just normal reporting. So your job really took about six to eight hours a day, and in addition to that, you flew two to three flights a day. Now each flight only lasted maybe roughly an hour and a half, maybe an hour, maybe two hours, depending upon whether we're going North Vietnam, over to Laos, or in South Vietnam. Uh, but each flight that is pre-planned, you'll spend at least four hours for every hour that you're flying in, in navigation planning, what weapons, intelligence, uh, what the bad guys have, uh, how we construct our flight, who we're going to refuel with, where our alternates are, where the Navy is, if we need an aircraft carrier. And it's, uh, it takes an awful lot of time. After the flight, you'll come back and intelligence will debrief you, and that'll take another hour of your time. So when you throw all this together, you're not going to get a lot of sleep. And in war, it's seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and that's what our life was like. Uh, our Marine fighter pilot uh, was responsible for not just fighter cap, uh, air to air, but air to ground, scrambles to go ahead and protect the thuds running up uh, on their big strikes or the alpha strikes from the Navy. We'd go ahead and do a barrier cap up in North Vietnam. And uh, we'd do it day and night. And uh, you learned uh, fear and you learned to uh, kind of control your emotions a bit in the cockpit. Uh, not that I can when I'm out of the cockpit, but you could in the cockpit. So it was, uh, I don't know, for us aviators, and I'm speaking for myself, but I think it's for everybody, we had a good mission because we were providing support for the Marines on the ground in i Corps, which is basically uh, south of the DMZ until the Army uh, in mid-South Vietnam took over the responsibilities. So we supported our Marines uh, on the ground and in the air, and we supported the Navy and Air Force in North Vietnam. Also uh, did many deep air strikes into North Vietnam that were uh, quite challenging. And uh, if you'd ever seen uh, footage of World War II movies where there's a lot of flak being shot up at the airplanes and you see smoke and you actually see the airplanes kind of vibrating, well, that's the kind of situation that we had in North Vietnam. Their defenses were well well designed to go ahead and try to down their enemy, our airplanes.
Yes. So I never knew that. So let, let me uh, keep going then because it'll probably help and just interrupt when you want, Carol. Um, on the day that I uh, ended up supporting Warren Kniep and then went back, found out I was going to be with 1st Battalion, 9th Marines, uh, it goes back in mind because the Marine Corps teaches every individual, uh, no matter what their rank or what their occupational specialty will be, that you're first a rifleman and you're trained that way. So it was never far from our mind that we'd have to be actually in combat. On the first day that we arrived in Vietnam, uh, after uh, we left Vietnam in December of 66 for a few weeks to go ahead to regroup, a lot of Marines were rotating back and we were getting new airplanes, F-8Es instead of F-8Ds. And uh, when we came back in country in February of 67, the first day that I was in country, I had the perimeter uh, watch that night where we take a platoon of Marines and uh, we make sure that Da Nang Air Base is protected. And on that first night, uh, we were attacked and uh, we had a firefight skirmish. And that was my first introduction into bullets whizzing by you in anger. So when I went to uh, 1st Battalion, 9th Marines, I was not, uh, I wasn't a novice, we'll say. And uh, when I joined them, uh, we were under a terrible attack. I joined 1-9 in a place called Contien. Did which you spell that? Uh, I have a hard time spelling that. I've forgotten now. I, I think it's C-O-N and then a hyphen T-I-E-N. And Contian was a, a Marine Corps base on the DMZ. The other base was Giolin, which I believe was G-I-O-L-U-N, with a D on the end of it. So the Giolin base was uh, to the east and Contian was to the west. And uh, Contian was very close to where the North Vietnamese would come down and uh, bring their weapons and their people down their marches. Anyway, when I joined them, we were under a terrible attack, and that lasted, uh, uh, I'm going to say, for two days, where you never got more than six inches above the ground. Uh, there was bullets, mortars, rockets coming in constantly. Uh, the North Vietnamese at that time, in July of 67, uh, was doing a big push. And if you remember uh, Quezon, uh, which was a uh, one of the bigger battles of the Vietnam War. Quezon uh, was just starting where the North Vietnamese were trying to overrun Quezon. In order to do it, they had to go ahead and take out Con uh, Tien, which was our fire base in support of Quezon. Uh, so when I joined the ground forces, 1-9, uh, my job was supposed to be the air officer, but my seniority in the Marine Corps as a relatively medium captain was senior to a couple of the company commanders. So the colonel expressed a desire to put me as a company commander. And quite honestly, I didn't feel I had the experience for a company commander. My MOS was a pilot. To go ahead and take 200 men with mortar platoons and uh, all the defenses and coordinate all the fires that a company commander has to do, knowing what listening posts and outposts to put people. I suggested to the colonel that there, that it was not in his best interest to put me there, nor the company men that I would command. So he ended up putting me as the assistant operations officer and the air officer. So again, I had multiple jobs. But as the air officer, I'd go out with the companies uh, on our sweeps, and we were out in the field for uh, no less than 10 days at a time without a resupply of any food and the conditions were quite harsh. Uh, uh, the enemy was always present, and there was always uh, firefights, and there was always wounded that we had to take out, uh, take back, and try to get help for them. <coughs> so, uh, if you can envision uh, living out in a jungle-type environment uh, without any food or supplies except what you carried on your back, uh, 
in the matter of ammo and water and food. And as far as clothing, um, what was recommended to me by a nice enlisted gunnery sergeant, just make sure you take plenty of socks. Mm -hmm. Because the worst thing for anybody on the move that's uh, on the ground is some kind of foot disease. Uh, anyway, it was, uh, they say war as hell, I can guarantee it was worse than that. Uh, August 22nd, I got wounded, uh, we got overrun. We were, on a, we were by Quezon on one of the hills just to the north and east of Quezon. And uh, it happened about 9 o'clock at night. 67? Uh, 67. And uh, the North Vietnamese at that time, uh, which probably isn't widely known, was uh, made up of an awful lot of Chinese and uh, other communist people dressed in North Vietnamese uniforms. And uh, a lot of them were uh, heavily, I would say, on some kind of drugs, because if we shot them, you could shoot them a couple times and they would still keep coming. They were uh, very uh, indoctrinated to go ahead and achieve their mission. So the firefights and the actual fighting was uh, pretty, uh, pretty violent. Uh, the night that I got hit, uh, I was uh, actually standing a watch. Even when we're out in the field at night, uh, you, you, you get very little sleep. Uh, we broke it up into two-hour watches that all the senior officers had to take. And the reason for that, in a company uh, which is around 200 men, you'll have platoons that are separated and the only way we talk is by radio. So on the watch stand, we'd have an air officer, uh, always, uh, or somebody representing air, somebody representing the artillery and somebody representing the commanding officer. So most of the time, uh, I was able to go ahead and represent all three of them. So you're in this little foxhole with all the radios and you have a couple of enlisted Marines with you to help sort it out because you can't talk on all the radios at once. And when we got hit, we got hit hard. So I crawled back to my fighting hole that I had dug earlier that evening and uh, because I needed to get my radio to talk to the airplanes themselves. My radio men were killed, and I got the radios from them, brought them into my hole. And uh, somewhere during that course of, of the night, I was wounded. And, uh, you know, people say that you see these things on movies where people get shot and they go crazy. It's not like that. It hurts when you get shot, believe me, but it doesn't hurt that bad. I got wounded in the belly, a uh, couple holes in the front, big holes in the back. It was raining, overcast. We were, you know, in mud in the fighting hole that I was in. I could feel where I was hurt and I could feel the holes that were in me and uh, too busy to do anything, so I just took mud and packed it around me. Probably not a good thing to do, but it may have saved my life. So around, this happened around 9 at night, and uh, so we were in a firefight all through the night. We couldn't get any artillery in, uh, and we couldn't get any air in because the weather was, uh, the ceilings near zero, raining hard. And eventually, around 4 o'clock in the morning, we got a helicopter in that I had called emergency helicopter. You talk about people with guts, the guys that uh, flew the helicopters, they came in to help us. And uh, they didn't have to. I don't know how this helicopter got in, but it was uh, what we call a um, <laughs> CH-34, uh, which was the workhorse of the Marine Corps back then. It was not a jet helicopter, it was reciprocating. Anyway, the pilots uh, landed on the knoll of the hill on the side, and he had to change the direction around because the door is on the right side of the helicopter, so he changed it so that the door was facing uphill. Corman came out, and he kept the airplane hovering there, basically on one wheel. And the corpsman made his rounds, and when he got to me, he said, Captain, you gotta, you got to get out of here. you got a serious wound. And I, I had been sitting in this hole, or kneeling, uh, for the past six, seven hours, and I did not realize uh, that I was really that hurt. And he talked me into getting out. Uh, I said that there's got to be other people worse than me. And he goes, no, you got a belly wound. you got to get out. So uh, he called over another Marine who got another captain. And uh, Captain Mike uh, Kelly came over and said, Beaver, you got to get out of here. Uh, by the way, my nickname was Beaver. Mm -hmm. 
And I said, Mike, I feel fine. He goes, no, you got to get out. So with that, I took off my bandoliers of uh, hand grenades and uh, I carried a, <clears throat> a shotgun and a 45 caliber. I took off my weapons and I gave them to Mike and I stood up and when I stood up, I fell flat on my face. I did not have enough energy to move my pinky. Then it, it got to oh. my brain that I'm in pretty serious shape. Mm -hmm. So I was put in the helicopter, basically thrown in, had my flak jacket and a helmet still on, and uh, I was in the helicopter belly with uh, about, I think there was a total of six of us wounded. And the helicopter has two pilots, they have a crew chief, and then they have a machine gunner. So the airplane was totally overweight, but somehow the pilot got us off. Unfortunately, when we got off and went down the side of the mountain that we were on, the bad guys opened up with their AK-47s, uh, and uh, it, in a helicopter that's made of magnesium, a round will come through the helicopter side in a little hole, and it will just glow and go big to about a six-inch diameter. Uh, in the helicopter, I got hit again, I had my helmet knocked off, oh, and no. two of the Marines that were in here were killed. Oh, no. and so eventually the helicopter made it out, striking some trees or high brush on the way down, got us over to Da Nang, uh, to Dong Ha, which was a, another Marine air base, forward air base, and that's where the helicopter probably originated from. And Dong Ha was under a rocket and mortar attack when we landed, so whoever has still had sense took us people that were wounded and put us in a ditch and the ditches over there are used for their latrines so they don't have a nice sewers system like we have in the u.s anyway i didn't know anything i was in and out of consciousness eventually they operated on me at don Ha medical and they found out that uh, they couldn't operate because they didn't have the uh, equipment necessary for severe belly wounds, so they sent me on a Air Force provider, I was told, down to Chu Lai, uh, to Charlie Medical, and there they operated on me, and I, I was out of consciousness for quite a while. <clears throat> I was told later that they sent me through Da Nang and the squadron VMF-235, the guys came over to say goodbye to me, but I was unconscious, mm -hmm. and the docs told them I probably wasn't going to I definitely wouldn't fly again. Well, I'm doing all the talking, Carol, so interrupt me if you need to. And I know that you fly again. You said you so, would either be here or out flying. So, uh, mm -hmm. at, after Da Nang, uh, they sent me to Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines uh, to their medical facility. And uh, I, want, I want to just put interject that all the medical people, whether in the MASH units, the what we call our medical uh, areas that the Marine Corps has, Navy provides, or to the Air Force at, at Clark and other facilities, which I'll tell you about later, all the doctors and corpsmen uh, that were there, uh, nurses, were just fantastic. And they treated you with respect and uh, did their job, uh, I think, to the best of their abilities. I was at Clark for a few weeks, uh, I was in and out of consciousness, and I have some uh, kind of humorous stories that I want to put on here, but uh, uh, eventually they moved me to Guam uh, Medical, and the Navy took care of me there for a few weeks, and eventually uh, they sent me back to the States. The problem, every time they moved me, peritonitis would start all over again. Mm -hmm. When I uh, Going back to when I was operated on, on probably the morning of the 23rd of August, 67, a good friend of mine, Norm Marshall, was up at uh, Dong Ha in what we call the FSCC, Fire Support Coordinating Center. And uh, Norm and I were buddies for a long time and pretty close. Norm knew that I was wounded, and uh, when he found out I was down at Charlie Med at Fubai, he uh, came down, I don't know how he got there, I was unconscious and I was lying on a, uh, on a uh, <laughs> whatever, you, whatever you call the bed, mm -hmm. uh, and I was just out. And Norm shook me and said, Beaver, i got to get back up to my post. And he said I opened my eyes and looked at him, and then I looked down at my belly. And what they had done was open up an incision from my chest to my groin, 
and I was laying on this bed with a kind of a, uh, a, a dolly that you would eat off of, and on that dolly was all my innards, all my guts, everything that was there, and my belly was opened up with steel rods holding it apart. Mm -hmm. And Norm said, I looked down at my belly, and my eyes went back up, and I went out. And I did not remember that until Norm I saw about a year later, and we got together. So anyway, I was pretty bad, so I, I had a colostomy, if anybody knows what that is. They gave me a loop colostomy, which is really moving your rear end to a, a portable area. And uh, I wasn't allowed to eat or drink for the next five months, never had a drop of water or ice, because we couldn't contain the infection. And I was operated on 12 times where they reopened me up. Uh, from uh, Guam, I went to Hawaii, uh, at, I can't think of the name of the base right now, at Honolulu. And after a time period there, went to Travis Air Force Base in California. And then somehow, someplace down in Texas that I don't remember, and up to Scott uh, in St. Louis. And each time that I was transported, uh, bad things happened inside, so I didn't recover and I had to stay there. And whenever I'd start to get a little better, they'd send me somewhere else. So I was down in Bethesda after, uh, after Clark, and eventually after Bethesda, they put me at St. Albans, where I remained until I was released from the hospital. And uh, I got out of the hospital somewhere in February or late January of 68. Um, and it wasn't until mid-December that they finally put back, closed the colostomy and uh, said that you are probably going to make it now. And that's when I had my first uh, drink of water or food uh, of any kind. And uh, I'd just like to tell you humorously or whatever, straightforward, that when you can have a bowel movement or actually pee using your own uh, body, it is very rewarding if you haven't been able to do that. So you know, I get out of the hospital. When I get out of the hospital or I was getting ambulatory, the Marine Corps does not like to have people not being used. So the Marine Corps uh, gave me orders while I was still in the hospital to go to uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard, and I became president of the court-martial board at uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, for a few weeks. I, I don't remember how many weeks. And it was a, a very uh, challenging position to try to be fair to all Marines and Navy personnel who ended up in uh, a bad way and were given court punishment, judicial punishment, that warrant them a, a, a court-martial. The general courts at that time, the max punishment we, uh, I was authorized to give, it was a five-member team, was uh, six months of hard labor, six months of forfeiture of uh, their money, and uh, a dishonorable discharge. And uh, we saw quite a few Navy and Marine personnel because it covered an area from Mississippi River all the way through Europe up to mid-Asia. And if anybody on a ship or uh, Marine or Navy or at any uh, base that we operated at a, got into serious trouble, they would end up back at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Anyway, I complained to Headquarters Marine Corps that I was ready to get back. And at that point, the Navy wanted to give me a medical discharge. So I got a civilian attorney and I got back into full duty with the Marine Corps except for flying. I was not allowed to fly. Uh, I was considered a class three aviator, uh, which is a person that when you get on an airliner, you make a right turn and go sit in the back. And after a number of uh, medical boards at uh, Beth, uh, Bethesda, uh, I got to be a class two aviator where I could operate as co-pilot. So at that point, I started flying DC-3s, C-47s, C-117s, TA-4 Skyhawks, T-1, uh, and T-33, which are two-person jets. And uh, a good friend of mine, Rocky Plant, was a uh, colonel in charge of uh, administrative, uh, which controlled all the orders for personnel for 2nd Marine Air Wing at Cherry Point, North Carolina. Um, Rocky told me, don't worry, Beaver, I'll get you back in a fighter airplane. And uh, true to his word, when I got my first class physical that day, 
uh, after coming back from Bethesda, he had me transferred to a squadron, a gun squadron called the MF uh, 513 at Cherry Point, where we flew F-4 Phantoms. Uh, so I flew F-4 Phantoms. Uh, my wife, uh, who was my girlfriend when I ended up in the hospital, coming out of the hospital tour, she came down, she was a teacher in Boston, north of Boston, Andover, but lived in Boston. She drove down to St. Albans uh, Hospital, I'd say almost every weekend, and uh, I got to uh, know that she was going to be my mate. Uh, we became engaged and uh, we eventually got married in August of 68. Uh, my dad died in, uh, in, on Thanksgiving Day in 1968, November 28th. I believe was the day, and uh, he had a, his own business, and my mom did the books for the business. I petitioned the Marine Corps to get out to, to exit the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps authorized the exit in April. Uh, I left the Marine Corps around March of '69 uh, with terminal leave to help my mom. My wife and I moved in with her in West Orange, and we closed up my dad's business. And at that time, uh, I started looking for a job, and I got hired by United Airlines, and I was a pilot with United for the next 34 years. And eventually, a check airman uh, on Boeing 747s, where I'd take new captains and co-pilots around the world to uh, get them qualified in the airplane. Uh, when I did get out of the Marine Corps, I joined the Marine Corps Reserves in April of 69, uh, uh, down at Willow Grove Naval Air Station, Marine Air Group 43 at the time. And they were, to my pleasure, flying F-8 Crusaders, which is what I flew in North Carolina and in Vietnam. And uh, that was VMF 511, Marine Fighter Squadron 511. And uh, we flew the F-8 until 92, maybe a little bit in 93. The Marine Corps Navy got out of the F-8 Crusaders, and we were given A-4 Skyhawks, a uh, different squadron, VMA-131. And uh, I matriculated through 131 eventually to become commanding officer of VMA-131 around 83 to 85. Promoted to colonel, ran all the tactical readiness for Marine Corps aviation for the reserve side of the house. Uh, which uh, extended throughout the United States, uh, whether it be helicopter, uh, attack airplanes, fighter airplanes. And that uh, I, my responsibilities were down in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, at 4th Marine Air Wing Headquarters. Uh, eventually, I came back to Willow Grove as a senior Marine at MAG 49, now Marine Air Group 49. and. Uh, at that time uh, was responsible for an operation called Solar Flare, 1990. And I was the commanding officer and we called it the ACE, Air Combat Element. We took 33 squadrons down to the Cherry Point, North Carolina, Bogue Field area, uh, New River Marine Corps Air, Air Station, and Camp Lejeune. And uh, we ran those 33 squadrons for two weeks. It was a culmination of two-year effort of uh, logistically organizing it, operationally planning it with safety, and we ran the 33 squadrons uh, against uh, the Air Force and Navy, and uh, we did all our flying at night with no lights and no communication. We didn't Why hurt anybody. That? Pardon? Why was that? Well, we're, I, from my experience, uh, as, uh, the person in charge of tactical readiness for the Marine Corps, I felt our next war is going to be without. It's mostly going to be done at night and you can't have lights on. And you're not going to be able to communicate because the bad guys at that time could understand our communication. So we did that and very successfully. We didn't hurt anybody. We didn't have any accidents. It was a very successful exercise. That was in uh, the summer of uh, 1990. And in January of 91, where we had this Operation Desert Storm over in Iraq, every squadron that uh, came with us uh, to North Carolina the preceding summer was activated and they went to war 
and they did not lose one person in, in that desert war, or nor did they hurt anybody, uh, any families. So the operation was a great success. I did not get activated in the uh, desert storm. I was a senior Marine, and uh, the Commandant of the Marine Corps at the time, uh, great guy. Anyway, uh, I petitioned to him and I said, General, how is it that I have to stay back with every person being activated? And he said, Beaver, do not worry about it. If the war, ground war goes on over two weeks, you're going to have a Marine Air Group in the desert over in Iraq area. Um, Al Gray was just a super Marine and held the respect of everyone. Al Gray, by the way, is a general, retired, commandant, retired and is from the Point Pleasant area of New Jersey. And sometimes maybe we could get him up here to talk mm. to you. To be a great okay. guy. So during that period, I retired in uh, 92, in June of 92. Uh, all the time, except for when I was hospitalized and grounded, uh, I was uh, flying airplanes. I accumulated, and I hate to talk about me, but that's what this interview is about. I had 4,700 hours of tactical jet uh, flying in the Marine Corps. I ended up with about 25,000 hours total when you combine United Airlines and private airplane flying. Uh, we've owned airplanes. Uh, Barbara and I have two boys uh, that were career Coast Guard. They went to the Coast Guard Academy, were pilots. Uh, Peter is a commander uh, at Elizabeth City, North Carolina. He flies and coordinates uh, the Coast Guard taking over an airplane called the C-27 Spartan. Uh, his younger brother uh, had 17 and a half years and exited the Coast Guard uh, this past June uh, with a uh, retirement. Uh, they had an early out program and uh, Paul is now flying for United Airlines as a pilot. Our daughter, who's the older of the three kids, is uh, out in Colorado Springs, and she's a vice president with Wells Fargo. So we're very thankful we have a good family. So I'll take any questions now. Wonderful story. Uh, when you were in the helicopter, you said you were mm -hmm. wounded again. Where were you wounded? I have no idea. Uh, my, I had so many wounds when I finally got operated on that I don't know which came first or later. Mm. But I do know in the helicopter that my helmet was shot and knocked off. And, uh, you know, you feel pain, but you, you don't really know where it's coming from. All my wounds were in my back and in my stomach, uh, coming entry from both sides, so I don't know which was which. Wow. Okay, I did some research thanks to the Marine Corps Aviation Chronologue, Eagles in Green. Mm -hmm. That came up for you. Okay. Air Combat Element ACE. Commander for Operation Solar Flare 1990, MAG 49, Deputy Group Commander, Mobilization Officer for Operation Desert Shield Storm. That's correct. That was so, your? Yeah, and that was all. And that uh, exercise uh, that we did uh, in 90, that's where we had the 33 squadrons that were working. And we worked the 33 squadrons, by the way. It's kind of interesting. We had one telephone line. Uh, for the ground to go ahead and coordinate everything. And we had one cell phone. Uh, cell phones were not very prominent back then. Mm -hmm. And the way that we organized, because we had airplanes based at Cherry Point, at our base at Oak Field, and down at New River. And then, of course, we had uh, ground counterparts down at Camp Lejeune, and we were dealing with Navy SEALs out of uh, Norfolk area at Little Creek. And uh, so what we did is use our helicopters that we had to go ahead and in the middle of the night, as soon as we could figure out the game plan to assign squadrons different missions, we'd send what we call the FRAG. The FRAG order will direct a squadron to have airplanes on station with whatever ordinance uh, required and what times to launch. Uh, we used motorcycles uh, to go ahead and uh, with anything that was urgent to get information out to the ground folks. And uh, this was kind of new to the Marine Corps. We've done it before in the Second World War, uh, but today we're, we're back doing the same thing. War is awful, and if you can't communicate, you've got to figure a way to communicate. Interesting. 
Okay, so I did um, a lot of the research that you already talked about. Um, you flew the same kind of jet we have out here, right? The F-4 Phantom? Yeah, the F-4 Phantom that's sitting out here. One of these days I'll sneak in and put my name on it. <laughs> do you have any photos of you with that out, out front? Uh, no, I don't think oh, so. We should do that. Um, let's see. I think you already talked about you were the commanding officer from 83 to 85 at Willow Grove. At Willow it? Grove. That was mm -hmm. uh, Marine Attack Squadron 131. And you were the director of readiness and safety from 87 to 89. That's correct. That's out of, <coughs> for the Marine Corps Reserves uh, out of New Orleans 4th Marine Air Wing. And in between there from 85 to 87 you were the Marine Air Wing Augment Chief of Staff G3, the 4th yeah. Marine Air Wing. That's correct. The G3 is in charge of all operations. Okay. Um, they had it as 4,600 tactical flight hours. You said 47? I think it's 4740. That's uh, close. And I probably put 4,600 because there was some flight training involved that was not in tactical jets. Oh, okay. Uh, out of those 150 combat missions, have we talked about your most memorable? Well, most memorable or most or, scary, I don't know. Uh, or the ones that come back to you this many yeah, years well, later? Or you have well, on one about? mission we got scrambled out of Da Nang and we only went about five minutes south of Da Nang and there was a platoon and company of Marines that were pinned down by the enemy. They had suffered uh, a lot of casualties and when we got on station, uh, we immediately saw where the firing was coming. There was automatic weapons and AAA uh, in the tree lines. And I uh, got clearance through an a airborne coordinator uh, that if I see where the enemy was just to go have at it. So I did and uh, we silenced them and, uh, and made multiple runs. And after the ordinance was expended, uh, the, our two airplanes went back to refuel at Da Nang. Well, I don't remember whether we flew again, but that uh, later that day, but that evening, uh, we had an officers club at Da Nang, and the officers club was built by the officers. It was built with uh, stone, mortar, cement, and uh, it was uh, it was sort of safe. It was probably the safest place because we lived in tents, and uh, I was at the officers club, and uh, this lieutenant colonel who was a ground officer came in and asked him. Uh, for the person or persons that were flying a mission south uh, earlier that day. Uh, I said I was there and he came over and he bought me a bottle of scotch and he said that uh, that we saved their lives. There was no question that mm -hmm. they would. So, and in fact, uh, he eventually wrote it up and I, I received a distinguished flying cross for that mission. But we didn't do it for medals. We do it because there were Marines uh, yeah, involved. Of so I'd say that's the kind of a highlight. Uh, we we ran a mission on a direct air support up at Vin, which is where the oil tanks were for North Vietnam. And uh, I was leading a flight of four. And uh, I, we had pre-briefed it, and we had areas where we'd go ahead and navigate to the uh, initial point initial point is a point that uh, the aviators will go ahead and uh, agree on and we'll start our attack from there and when I popped up and started in I had never seen such fire in all my life at AAA. I was coming in from about 10,000 feet uh, and uh, armed with uh, uh, low drag bombs, uh, rockets and 20 millimeter and the airplane was just uh, shaking violently from the explosions all around it. And uh, as I got rid of my weapons I, and was pulling off the target, I made a call, and uh, Dash 2 had already turned in. I made a call for 3 and 4 not to come in. Well, 3 came in anyway, uh, and number 4 aborted. Number 3 uh, got shot and, uh, or took weapons in his airplane, said he was hit, and uh, the airplane became uncontrollable and he never got out and he crashed. And it was, uh, you know, a, a very terrible uh, moment. And there wasn't anything that we could do because I, I saw the airplane crash and I never saw a parachute. And uh, the gent's name was uh, Ron Hellback, and it was Ron's 100th mission 
and he was due to go home shortly oh. after. And uh, it was, so anyway, that was a terrible mission. Other missions, uh, you know, they're all important. You can think of them all. Uh, the night barrier caps that we ran in North Vietnam uh, over Hanoi. Uh, What's every, that? Uh, you would set up a fighter cap to make sure that MiGs wouldn't be coming up and to provide support for whatever alpha strikes or thuds uh, that were running up to North Vietnam. Thug, you said that before, thugs, thuds? Thuds, uh, at, at Air Force F-105s, nicknamed thuds. Oh, okay. Uh, anyway, uh, to have a SAM missile go by your cockpit pretty close is a very uh, awakening experience. Uh, so I would say those would, that would probably be highlight. I came back from how a mission. How big is the, a missile? A how sandwich? big is the missile? You know, I don't remember exactly. Uh, I think they were 30 to 40 feet long. And no, I mean, can you hold up your hands how wide it was? Oh, yeah. No, they're, you know, you can look them up. They were like telephone poles. And when they came by, they're a rocket coming up, and they have, uh, uh, if they hit you directly, they'll explode. And if they don't hit you directly, if they're close enough, they have a proximity fuse that will send metal fragments uh, into the airplane. So seeing those uh, makes you believe that you are a pretty small character in this whole evolution. Uh, one mission, uh, when I came back, I was extremely low on fuel. I couldn't get rid of my ordnance. That, that makes the plane have high drag and very inefficient, and you're using a lot more fuel. I was making an emergency uh, landing at Da Nang, landing to the south came up over the pass that's north of, uh, there's a bay north of Da Nang, and then there's mountains north of the bay. And as I came over the mountains, descending through the clouds in the black at night, all of a sudden uh, enemy fire erupted around the airplane. So I added power, which I didn't want to do, and went back up in the clouds and continued then my descent down. Well, as I got closer to the, to the airport, uh, two things happened. Uh, one, the engine quit on the airplane, uh, which means it flamed out, and I did not have uh, any any place to go. On um, all military airplanes and most civilian, we have a uh, external fan that we can go ahead and put out into the airstream, and we call that a RAT, a ram air turbine, and that will provide hydraulic power and electrical power. So I put out the RAT and uh, told the tower I'd flamed out. And just at that point, all the lights at Da Nang Airport went out. Tower came up on an emergency radio and said, uh, go hold, uh, go around, and hold south of the field. And uh, I said, oh, I can't. So I came in and uh, I found the runway, but I didn't know where I was on the runway when I landed. Uh, but I was on the runway and stopped the airplane, pulled it off to the side, got out of the airplane. Now you have to understand it didn't have an engine so we didn't have lights and uh, the airplane was just kind of a ghost ship landing. Get out of the airplane, walked over to the crash crew which are like fire trucks mm -hmm. to take care and help aviators if they should uh, crash an airplane. And I said, you got an airplane on the runway about a thousand feet back. I said, you're kidding. I said, no, I'm not kidding. Well. That shook me up pretty much, and I went to my CO's tent that night, and I don't know what time it was, two, three in the morning, and I said, Colonel, I don't feel like flying anymore. Uh, that kind of really shook me up. Mm -hmm. uh, Ed Rogal is his name, good guy, and uh, Ed brought out a bottle of scotch, and we finished the bottle of scotch, and he and I went flying first thing in the morning, and if we didn't do that, I probably would have never gotten in another airplane in my life. So that was kind of a... Mm -hmm. Uh, an exciting mission, I guess. I don't understand why all the lights went out on the runway. Uh, they had just taken, uh, there's generators just like we have um. here, and somehow the incoming, Da Nang was attacked frequently, not every night, but almost every night, with rockets, and somehow they knocked out the power supply. And so the lights never came back that night. It took the next day to figure out how to get them back. Now the airplanes that did come back, uh, besides me, they went and held and eventually couldn't land there. I, I was probably the only airplane to land after the lights went out. The rest of them went down to our Marine base at Chu Lai, which was about 50 miles south. Mm -hmm. 
Any other questions? When you, if, did you ever land at Chulai? No. Oh, okay. So I interviewed someone, Mad 12, mm -hmm. and they did the launch and recovery. They yep. caught the planes. Yep. So a lot of stories with that. All right, I think we, oh, I had a question about your, um, your time in the hospital when you couldn't, there was nothing by mouth for you for years, right? Uh, no, for months. Uh, oh, months. I got, you know, I got wounded August 22nd, somewhere in December. Um, they put me back together, so December, January was the first time I had something to eat or drink. So in that time when you weren't allowed to, did they even give you ice chips? No, no. You had IV, I right. had IV and, and plasma and, and, tube. and tubes uh, yeah. going out. So tubes in, tubes out. Not very mobile, not very comfortable. Did you have family visit you? My mom and dad were over in West Orange, and what the uh, services try to do, at least the Marine Corps, if you're injured, uh, critically injured, and you're going to be hospitalized, they try to get you to the hospital nearest to where your family is. So I had family, but those were bad days. This was in uh, 67, and Vietnam uh, became very unpopular, and uh, newspaper, news people, uh, you know, were not friendly to any of the uh, people that were serving in Vietnam. And uh, I had a couple of high school friends come over and tell me that I was a baby killer. And, oh, no. You know, it was, yeah. You cannot uh, describe how bad uh, service people were treated back in the, in the 60s. That's shocking. Your high school friends came to the hospital to say yeah. that to you? Yeah, that's correct. What did you say? Well, I took the uh, bottle of plasma that was sitting on my right, and I threw it at him, and I said, see you. I do not want to see you again. Right. And consequently, you'll find that most people really won't talk very much about a war experience, because it's so hard to talk to somebody who wasn't there. Mm -hmm. You course. end up talking, and you just become a creature that people don't understand. So oh. I, don't, I don't think you'll ever get too many details, hard details, about actual war. You get a smattering, and, uh, and the people, this is just a comment that I have. Uh, I've seen a lot of people go you know, off the deep end because of their experiences with war. The only thing I can suggest that for me, being in the Marine Corps Reserves uh, helped me an awful lot because we had helicopter pilots, we had people who were ground officers and ground people, and you can share your stories with other people who have been there, but you can't share your stories with your immediate family or friends because they will never understand uh, how difficult the situations are. You can't paint that picture. So if anybody, if you can learn anything from me, uh, uh, the Marine Corps had asked me for even in current uh, skirmishes, wars that we have today to talk to different people that are going over uh, and will be involved in combat. And uh, I'll, I'll give them the same routine. You wear your flak jacket and you make sure it's zipped all the way up. You wear your helmet and you make sure it's on tight. You carry plenty of ammo and you carry a couple pair of socks and you make sure that your feet and your enlisted or whoever you're responsible for that their feet are without any problems because you can't move if your feet aren't working. And uh, aside from that, you got to make sure that you're friends with everybody that you're with. Whether you agree with them or not, you better be very friendly because you're going to be taking care of them and they're going to be taking care of you. Yeah, that's a question I had about your own experiences. Like when you said you couldn't be higher than six inches from the ground? You can't. You go to the bathroom six inches above the ground, you will not go higher than that because there are bullets flying, there's mm -hmm. shrapnel flying, and uh, yeah, yeah. And the people you were with, um, you were friends with, I guess? Friendly uh, You with. become real friendly with the people that you're with. You're in close quarters for a long time. And then the people that you lost, you had known and you were mm -hmm. yeah, buddies it's, with? It's terrible. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry for your loss. Uh, when you got home, uh, when you got out, what did you do? Did you join any veterans groups? Uh, did you have? Let me, any? Let, me, let me just uh, comment because I just thought of this. 
When I was wounded, I weighed about 165 pounds. When I was in the hospital, I was down to 118 pounds. Um, and that's obviously from not having uh, food and drinking. Uh, when I got out in 1969 off active duty, I did not join. Uh, actually, uh, my, let me think back. My father-in-law, my wife's dad, God bless him, who was not in any military, suggested I go to the VA. And uh, at some point, somewhere around 1973, I'm not sure, uh, give or take a year, I went and registered with the uh, Veterans Administration. And the Veterans Administration at the time was very slow, very parochial, and uh, still is today uh, in the majority of cases. And uh, they eventually uh, were of assistance to me medically, and eventually they gave me a stipend. They have, uh, I've got a 60% disability for combat wounds. Uh, I did not join any other organizations because I was active in the Marine Corps Reserves. And so, and by active, I mean uh, at least one day a week, one weekend a month on average probably six to ten days a month of dealing with other Marines. In the meantime, raising a family and working a full-time job, there really wasn't a lot of time to do anything. Right. Uh, over the years I supported them. I uh, did join, I don't remember when, but I never took part of it. Uh, the VFW, Veterans uh, Foreign Wars, uh, joined the Marine Corps Reserve Association. Uh, the Purple Heart Society, uh, and a couple other organizations that I can't remember right now. But there, I was really Disabled. joining them to support them, not to do anything or to volunteer. More recently, I found out the Marine Corps League, which uh, meets here in Manasquan at the VFW Lodge. Um, I met the gentleman, uh, Brian uh, Gillespie. Uh, who was a uh, police officer in Manasquan and a Marine. And uh, he, he wanted me to join and I kept pushing back uh, from joining because I didn't want to... Uh, my time was of concern up, in, up until recently with uh, jobs and whatever. And uh, when he told me that they go down once or twice a year to Bethesda to go ahead and have a cookout barbecue for the serious wounded Marines, and Navy corpsmen, well, that triggered me that I'd do it. So I joined the Marine Corps League, and I've been active in the Marine Corps League here chapter, Jersey Shore chapter, Manasquan, uh, for the last several years. Uh, the only other activity that I've done locally, we moved to Seager, New Jersey in 1973. Uh, the Marine Corps has a birthday every year. It's November 10th, uh, going back to 1776. And uh, when I moved here, I felt that the area needed to have some way to celebrate the Marine Corps birthday. So there was a bar restaurant in Seager called Edgar's. Uh, it's a different name right now. I don't know what the name of it is. Reef and Barrel. Beef and, reef or Beef and Barrel? Reef. Yeah. Reef and Barrel. And uh, I have been there, and I have had a hamburger, and they're good. But Edgar's uh, supported me and allowed me to run a uh, kind of a birthday party for Marines on November 10th every year until the owners of Edgar's and the people that were managing it eventually died or and were bought out. So on November 10th I'd take ads in the Coast Star and the Asbury Press that all Marines are invited and uh, we'd have a big birthday cake and a little celebration. Later on a gent in Seeger by the name of Bill Sitar who was a Marine has uh, a small golf course called Twin Brooks up in Tinton Falls. And Bill said, Bob, why don't we have it up at Twin Brooks? And we moved it there, I'm going to say somewhere around 1995, and ran it there for about 10 years. And Bill was an su extreme supporter of it. Uh, he's a commercial realtor, and uh, he would go ahead and send out from his office invitations to all the Marines that I could get addresses or email addresses to and we've run it there for years. Now, two years ago, the Marine Corps League has started uh, their annual, maybe more than two years, but uh, they now have a birthday celebration uh, that's worthy, 
and uh, we've stopped doing it at Bills and Tenton Falls and at Edgar's, and uh, we host it wherever uh, the Marine Corps League chooses. This year it was on North Main Street at the, uh, I can't remember, the, the old Main Street Bar, I don't know what it's called, and so we do that. Other than that, no. I, I go and I talk. The Army asked me to talk to their people uh, when they're being activated, uh, and I'll go and talk to them occasionally uh, on request. Uh, I've talked to them. They've had uh, affairs or seminars up at uh, the old Fort Monmouth. They no longer do it there. Uh, they're trying to go ahead and get organized over at, uh, can't think of it. Uh, Camp Evans, and um, I go to Lakehurst, uh, where I've done quite a bit of the catapult and uh, resting gear suitability test uh, for the Navy uh, using the tactical airplanes from Royal Grove. So I know my way around Lakehurst, and recently I took uh, members of our Jersey Aero Club on a tour of the Lakehurst facility. Uh, but other than that, no. Mm -hmm. You're everywhere. No, I'm not everywhere. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll, I'll put a plug in. Um, I was on the board of directors for the museum over at Willow Grove Naval Air Station, which no longer exists, but the museum will exist forever. Oh, and nice. I, I had to drop out of being on the board of directors. I just didn't have the time to commit to it. Uh, we tend to winter in Florida now as the older years are setting in. Uh, and. Uh, well, I was a secretary treasurer of an organization called the National Marine Corps Scholarship Foundation where we raise money for wounded and deceased Marines children uh, to get them educated. Uh, everybody's got problems financially, but uh, it's a shame that our veterans who have given so much really don't have the monies to support their families. Oh, okay. It's a very worthy cause. Close to your yeah. heart, too. Yeah, close to my heart. And uh, the other thing, as Carol, I, I showed her, the Marine Corps has a presence here at Seeger uh, at yes. the Army camp. And uh, I'm sure Carol will let people know about it. And maybe we can bring some more Marines back here as the time goes on. Okay. Well, the Marine Corps League has their leadership college here every year in March. Really? It's a huge event. Know. They have to come the day that. before, right in this room. They have to come the day before and set it up. Oh, for their leadership. Yes, okay, I did know that. All right, so we'll start with Villanova. Okay. Wow, I'm taking a lot of your time. It's okay. Villanova Graduates Commissioned, and you are on the right. No, yeah, I'm kind of in the center, uh, front. Let me point it out to you, and then you can see it. Okay, sorry. I got to put my glasses just to make sure I recognize the handsome devil I used to. <laughs> okay, so. Right in there. Okay. So those are the Marines that were commissioned uh, on graduation, June fourth of nineteen sixty-four. Okay. We have this book. Your squadron? Yeah, this is uh, goes back to around 73, 74. Uh, it's VMA 131, and I'm standing all the way on your left. You are? Yes. I standing? have a slight mustache. Oh my gosh, how can that be you? I don't know, but I recognize it. I don't think that's you. You don't see that? Let me look again just to make sure. <laughs> now, this guy right here. That's Before you? My finger. That is me. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee you. Okay. We'll get my wife over. <laughs> okay. Uh, this. It's kind of interesting for people who don't know, that's firing rockets, air-to-ground rockets. The airplane's an A-4 Skyhawk. Nice. And these are in uh, protection, so you're probably not going to see it. Uh, courtesy of the Air Force, uh, 
getting a little free fuel uh, from a oh, KC-135 right, yeah. tanker. And that's an A4 Mike or an A4M model. Is that a strato tanker? Uh, I'm not going to commit to that. It's a KC-135. I'm okay. not sure of the designation. That's a hard airplane to refuel from. Here, I have a better picture of it right here. Okay. Why is it hard to refuel from? Well, if you take a look at the hose that's out there, yeah. it's pretty short. So oh, okay. you've got to bring the airplane up, and uh, the pilot of the A-4 has to fly the probe, a refueling probe, into that drogue. And then you have to back the hose into the airplane uh, about half the distance in order to get fuel to flow. So when the airplane is there, it's right under, right. it's about 10 feet under the body of the KC-135. 10 feet right there? Now the body of the airplane is like right here. It goes back, it, the, the belly of the 135 goes up. This is coming out of underneath um, a... Uh, I forget what the Air Force calls it. still you have to be careful not to Yeah, crash. you're not going to hit that, but you've got to push this thing in. And what's happening now, the turbulence from the big airplane is interacting with the tail of your smaller airplane. And so it's, you're constantly being vibrated uh, around. It's incredible whoever thought that up to refuel by air. Yeah. <laughs> So this is the way the Marine Corps refuels. We use C-130s, uh, and the C-130 has pods on the wing that allows the drogue, uh, the hoses to come out, and they come out 80 feet. Oh, okay. And uh, then we push it into about 40 feet to the mid mark, and then we can hold it there, and it's a lot smoother. Uh, the problem with the C-130, though, you can only do mid-altitude refueling, uh, 20,000 feet more or less and below. My World War II guys said that they couldn't land if they still had their bombs. Yeah, today we land with bombs. If you can't get rid of them, you, you can land with them. So that started in Vietnam? Uh, it's, it started before that because we'll have to be able to bring airplanes back aboard the aircraft carriers. So oh, okay. even the Second World War. But you okay. didn't have to jettison your bombs before you? No, well, you try to. Uh, it depends on what kind of bombs you have. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, and I don't want to get into that, but uh, it's, I don't know exactly <laughs> right. what's classified and what isn't. Okay, that, uh, we were under a rocket attack at Da Nang. That was an F-8 Crusader, and a uh, rocket had uh, either hit it directly or uh, shrapnel caused it to go on fire, uh, but not much left. Mm -hmm. That was sometime in the summer. Uh, oh my gosh, this goes way back. Uh, platoon leader class, my finger is on myself. Okay. If I doubt if you're going to recognize me. I know what I look like, so I can recognize yeah. myself. Yeah, that looks like you. So that was in the summer of uh, probably wow. 1962. You look very young. You're like a boy here. Oh, I am. I was, only, I was 17 when I started college, so I was 18 there. Oh, okay. We're all, you know, when you look like a boy, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah you're probably not going to see this. Okay, different weapons. This is a 2,000 pound bomb where my finger is. I don't know whether you can see that, but you can see the size of it. They're big. Okay. And it's okay. one of the few airplanes that would carry it. Okay. It was an F 8 Crusader. This is the different ordnance that an airplane, they can't carry it all at once. But we'll show you the different type of ordnance that uh, the airplane was capable. Mm -hmm. Every airplane is designed for a different factor. Uh, the F-8 was designed to be a fighter, but the Marine Corps in Vietnam realized that we needed to be able to, to carry bombs. Yeah, just looking through personal pictures. What's the story with this? Uh, I went up to, uh, uh, outside of Da Nang, up on the Monkey Mountain. Uh, there, we called the mountain Monkey Mountain. I don't know what the official name. It was just to the east of uh, the airfield. <coughs> uh, 
uh, we had a Hawk battalion. A Hawk is uh, a ground-to-air missile, quite, quite large, like the telephone pole SAMs. And I uh, went up to coordinate because they were, they had to do practice firing of them. Uh, they were to supply the defenses for Da Nang Air Base. So on my way up, I had a driver and, uh, with me and a jeep. And we stopped at that rock, and that rock had some painting, and I thought it was a, a picture opportunity. Oh, okay. And then this is the plane that you flew. Just wanted to show that. Yeah, that's the F-8 Crusader. Okay, and this is a, a picture of, of the squadron pilots in Willow Grove F-8 Crusaders. And, uh, During your time in the reserves? Yeah, this is probably around 71, and that's me above my middle finger. Okay. Is that the yearbook that you, you wrote? Yeah, we, could, we have a cruise book, and some squadrons do it, some don't. Uh, anyway, when we were in Vietnam, uh, somebody suggested we needed to do a cruise book, and the sea commanding officer suggested that I be the one to do the cruise book. So ended up doing a cruise book. And what we did was take a picture of everybody, every enlisted Marine, uh, and ran it by shops. And actually, uh, I've seen uh, a few of these gents in the most recent, and uh, it was it was uh, a good thing to have. I mean, we were all young back then. This is a, this was a, not the full squadron, but it was close to it. And I am this this guy where my okay. thumb is. So that was taken in 1960, Christmas of 66. Where? Uh, that picture was actually taken at uh, Naha Air Force Base, Okinawa. Oh, okay. How do you spell that? N-A-H-A. -A. Oh, okay. There's a story behind each one, but there won't be too much to uh, this one come out. When we take arrested landings, they use a, a hydraulic system. Uh, this is called a Morest, and it's a B-52 braking system that's in an inertial reel. And I don't really know how it works, but we have a tail hook on the airplane, and it catches a wire and help slow us down. And uh, that was at Denang. The Marine Corps has a, rest, a Morris type system at every runway. At one time, uh, the Navy asked me to do all the testing of airplanes after they were overhauled. And there was an outfit in uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania called Stombach. And so I went over to the Navy requested the Marines to help them out. They had A-4 Skyhawks that they were using in the Navy Training Command, two C, two seaters, TA-4s. And I went over to Harrisburg and I looked at the facility and I looked at the operation and I said, we can do it as long as you put a resting gear in the, on the runway at Harrisburg. Well, the Navy and Marine Corps did and I uh, tested every airplane that came out of the overhaul. And it's, the resting gear is probably still there. Oh. And, Nice. Commercial pilots are probably wondering why that wire was ever put there. Huh. All right, so we also have different ceremonies, change of command from 83, from a retirement ceremony from 92. Let me show you a picture from that. Yeah, of age from those other pictures a little bit. Okay. And we have Mag 49. There's a, oh, it's the history of Mag 49. Yeah. 
Marine Air Group 49 now, since they closed Willow Grove Naval Air Station with the BRAC uh, system that closed several years ago now, mm -hmm. uh, Marine Air Group 49 has moved over to Fort Dix. They're actually at the end of the runway at McGuire Air Force Base, but it's on Fort Dix's property. So it's uh, the group headquarters is there. They have helicopter CH-53s, and they also uh, have responsibility for the C-130Js that are up at Stewart Air Force Base, and helicopters assigned to Norfolk Naval Air Station, and aviation assets down at Andrews Air Force Base. So MAG-49 is still in operation. Locally. Since 9-11, um, it's important, I think, that we talk about how strategic New Jersey is with what we have, and we're the closest yeah. to the main cities. How strategic. With our uh, well, aircraft? Yeah, New Jersey, uh, you know, we, uh, with public knowledge, we have F-16s at Atlantic City. Uh, we have, <coughs> of course, uh, support airplanes that the Air Force and the Air National Guard have at McGuire Air Force Base that uh, ferry troops and cargo around the world. Uh, also at McGuire, we have uh, the Marine Air Group with helicopters and support uh, airplanes, support people for all of the Marine Air Group's assets, which also entails uh, not only the people to work on the air, but the people that will support it. The uh, Marine Corps is fully operational. Uh, to, we're in the uh, stateside, we're on a 24-hour alert for the active duty. Marine Reserves are 48 to 72 hours. Everything is mobile. We don't have any permanent uh, positions. We have field desks and folding chairs. And uh, if we're ordered to go someplace, we just pack up and we leave. Now, some of the support that we need if we go to an airfield, we need to build our own airfield, so we've got two portable airfields. We've got three of them really, but one's out at 29 Palms, uh, California in the desert. The other two are pre-positioned on somewhere. And uh, we can go with the help of Navy Seabees and establish a base within 24 hours. So the Marine Corps itself has to bring all its command and control. We have to bring our tower operators, the approach gear, uh, support with cooks, uh, chefs, uh, military police, fire, crash crew. Uh, whatever you see at a regular airport, the uh, Marine Corps has to have. And one of the reasons Congress has always asked, why do we need a Marine Corps? Because the Marine Corps is the only outfit that's capable of doing that. Uh, and I hope that the Marine Corps continues because I think it's a good bang for the buck for, for our American taxpayers. So, what else is in New Jersey? Of course, we have the Air National Guard. We have the National Guard in New Jersey. And we have an awful lot of veterans in New Jersey, uh, if we're ever called upon. New Jersey, close to New York, and that's kind of scary to be so close to New York when you look at what happened to Twin Towers, you know that People who do not like us uh, think that New York is a very big target, and probably always will be. Uh, but in New Jersey, we have the assets to support New York whenever they need it. We also, in New Jersey, not too many people know, but we have Coast Guard headquarters uh, up on Staten Island. And the Coast Guard uh, has airplanes at Atlantic City. We have helicopters. Um, they use uh, the 65, which is the French-made Dolphin, and up and down the coast we have Coast Guard boats to get out and help people in distress on the water. And one thing I learned about the Coast Guard, which uh, my period of active duty with the Marine Corps, we never really worked with the Coast Guard, even though the Coast Guard was in Vietnam, they were in Iraq, and they're currently uh, serving over in the Indian Ocean. The Coast Guard, uh, because our two boys went into the Coast Guard, they went to the Coast Guard Academy first and then spent uh, 17 and a half years and 21 years for the other boy. Uh, we've gotten to know what the Coast Guard does. When we talk about assets, the Coast Guard's at war 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's not the war that we call war, but it's survival. If somebody gets hurt and needs help, the Coast Guard's there. Very well said. That's well said.
Okay. And then how many total hours do you have flying? Well, I, you know, it's kind of, it was always hard for me to go ahead and uh, total my hours because I sometimes didn't keep exact log. Military time, I have 4,740 hours. Uh, United Airlines, uh, I had somewhere around 18,000 hours. Civilian, I've owned my own airplane and I fly now locally with the Jersey Aero Club out of Lakewood Airport. And I've operated a citation for up until a year ago uh, for the previous 10 years, which is a small business jet, eight passenger, two pilot. Uh, combining all the times, and then there's simulator time, I have roughly 25,000 hours total. Uh, Carol handed me back what I showed her, the uh, department, uh, the FAA, uh, Federal Aviation, uh, has given me uh, the title of Master Pilot, and uh, I'm honored to receive it. Uh, I, it. They asked for quite a bit in the way of background before giving that designation. They want you to be 50 years as a pilot, and that's a pilot in command. Uh, of airplanes and that you had to work safety uh, and sponsor safety throughout your career. And uh, I have uh, run a business, I still have it, it's called Post Flight, where I investigate airplane accidents on behalf of insurance carriers and defense attorneys uh, and have had that business since 1976. And I have attended all the safety schools that the uh, Navy and Marine Corps offered and have a considerable background. So anyway, the FAA gave me that designation. I'm honored to have received it. And that just happened this past summer. Do you remember this? Well, you know, I don't really remember it, but I was passing through Honolulu after when they put me on an airplane to get out. I don't know who the general is. Uh, but he came and pinned a purple heart on me. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody that's wounded in action uh, is eligible for the purple heart. Unfortunately, you have to have somebody uh, verify that you're wounded in action. So sometimes it takes a while. So even though I was wounded in August, that probably didn't happen until September or late September, mm -hmm. October time frame. This is a great retirement picture. Well, it wasn't a retirement picture. Oh, Marine okay. Corps requires that uh, to have a photograph of their senior officers. And oh, okay. A colonel in the Marine Corps actually is, uh, you obviously have generals. You have uh, one star, two star, three star, and four star. Uh, the Marine Corps, I tell people, is run by colonels. Uh, and that's a lie because it's run by corporals. We give all the authority and responsibility to the corporals of the Marine Corps to go ahead and get the jobs done. Colonels are around just to do paperwork and to make sure we're moving in the right direction. <laughs> Is that why you said I really run the museum? <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's so funny. It's true, I guess. Do you have anything else that you want to add? No. Carol, I'm surprised that you spent so much time with me. I, I hope it's not uh, too boring for you. This was a very interesting interview. And I just want to say, Bob, I'm honored and humbled that you came here today to speak to me of your sacrifice and contribution that you made in service to your country. And thank you, and welcome home. Well, thank you. I, I will make one more remark. Uh, people ask me why I stayed in the Marine Reserves or contributed after uh, I got off active duty. The Marine Corps gave me the training to be a pilot, and that pilot has provided me a, a source of income and an occupation for the rest of my life. So <clears throat> I not only owe the Marine Corps, but all the taxpayers of the United States mm -hmm. for the efforts and the, uh, the money that was involved. Uh, they told us when we went to flight school it cost about a million dollars. That was back in 1964. Oh. I have no idea what the cost would be to get an aviator trained and qualified to fly a fighter today, whether it be an F-18, F-14, uh, F-14s are gone, F-18, F-15, F-16, or the newer F-35s and F-22s. It's uh, got to be huge, but it's uh, well worth investment. So, well Semper said. Fi. Semper Fi.